On the Canadian prairies, where much of the world's grain is harvested, the weather means the difference between good crop and bad, success and failure, and sometimes life and death. It is Friday, July 14th, 2000. In an area of central Alberta, not far from the city of Red Deer, Dennis Dudley, a severe weather specialist with Environment Canada, travels north with his family on the first day of their summer vacation. It was a beautiful day, a, a sunny start. There was virtually no cloud, but there was that mugginess in the air. But as he approaches Red Deer, Dennis can see storm clouds forming along the foothills of the Rocky Mountains, 100 kilometers to the east. And it's the foothills of the Rocky Mountains that really is the breeding ground for a lot of thunderstorms. Dennis notices one ominous cloud drifting on the southern edge of the formation. It seems harmless for now, but he decides to keep an eye on it. On the shores of Pine Lake, 25 kilometers southeast of Red Deer, the skies are still bright and blue over the Green Acres campground. It is already filling up with families looking forward to a beautiful summer weekend. That day at Pine Lake, it was so hot. I can remember being just stifling, like to breathe in the air, it was warm. Very mucky, very, I don't know how to explain it. It was just a different air. Like many of the campers, Kelly and Clark Garrett are regulars at Green Acres, who leave their trailers year-round on the hillside sites leading down to the lake. Pine Lake was a very big part of our lives, the home away from home for us. Carpenter Willie Proven and his wife Margaret have vacationed at Pine Lake for 24 years. They plan to leave their hilltop campsite earlier that morning but decide to wait for the arrival of their son, Scott, so they can celebrate his fiancée's birthday. 73-year-old widow, Phyllis Galberg, has been a permanent summer resident since she and her husband moved their trailer to one of the campground's hillside locations. It was my second home, because after Chris passed away, I stayed there for eight years by myself, and I enjoyed every day of it. On this particular Friday, Phyllis is planning to drive home in preparation for a holiday with her daughters. The heat was unbearable, and you couldn't find a cool spot anywhere. Even to have a cool drink didn't help. So I thought, I'll wait till 7 o'clock. Maybe it'll cool down, and I'll be able to go. But Phyllis has the nagging premonition that something is about to happen, a feeling she has shared with her neighbors. I had told several of them that something was coming, but I don't know what. And they just giggled at me and said, oh, oh yeah, she's predicting again. And, and all little did, did I know that I was actually predicting something. While they may not share Phyllis Galberg's uneasiness, cottage owners on the opposite shores of Pine Lake would agree it's the best place to be on this hot, humid Friday. My wife and daughter and myself Drove up to my mom and dad's place on Thursday morning. I had heard on the radio, um, uh, coming from Red Deer to, to Pine Lake, that uh, there was thunder showers in the forecast, but that it was going to be a real nice weekend. On the highway near Red Deer, meteorologist Dennis Dudley hears the same forecast, but shares Phyllis Galberg's feeling that something more may be on the way. Because we got to Red Deer, I said to my wife, let's just hang on here for a few hours. Let's just see how this situation develops because my spidey sense has been tingling. And with the storms developing off the foothills and moving eastward, I was naturally concerned about how strong they might be. The ominous cloud that caught his attention earlier has definitely changed. On one side, it pours rain. On the other, warm, dry air billows into the familiar anvil shape of a supercell. A supercell is just like a thunderstorm, except with one very significant exception. Supercells have a rotating center. And that rotating center is really what causes uh, tornadoes to be born. 
While only a few supercells actually turn into tornadoes, Dennis is concerned enough to call Environment Canada's storm center in Winnipeg. Colleagues there are monitoring the same storm front on radar, but have also been watching a formation 30 kilometers south of Red Deer. Known as a dry line, it is extremely rare, but is also associated with severe thunderstorms. If you were driving across a dry line, it, in, in one minute it would be dry, you'd think, oh, what a beautiful sunny day. And on the other side, it becomes muggy and, and heavy in that, that moist tropical air, that feeling you get when it's that really warm, muggy day. Driving north on Highway 2 towards Red Deer, it started to drizzle on our windows. So that was a clue as to how strong the dry line might be. Dennis Dudley and his colleagues know that if the Thunderhead collides with the dry line, it will feed on this moisture-laden air, causing it to expand rapidly. We knew that we were dealing with a potential severe storm here. They ended up issuing a severe thunderstorm watch at around 5.30. And that just suggests the public to be aware of potential weather in that area. While most Pine Lake residents never hear the warning, some see dark clouds approaching from the east around 6 p.m. When it started to get dark, it didn't surprise me because I had heard it on the radio and thought, okay, well, I'll go put the tarp on the boat and look after some of my mom's uh, flowers and uh, no big deal. We'll get a thunder shower and, and we'll be off to the races in the morning. Phyllis Galberg, however, finds nothing familiar in the approaching clouds or in the pall they seem to cast over the campground. I remember the clouds were terrible. You couldn't believe how they looked. I never seen colors like that. And it was so quiet. There wasn't a dog barking. There was no kids screaming or hollering. Even the, the guys in the boats weren't racing around like they would normally. On the highway, Dennis Dudley watches the Thunderhead hit the dry line, morphing into the threatening shape of a full anvil. It was almost a blur how fast it occurred. And when it started to interact with the dry line, that's when it developed explosively into this severe, severe thunderstorm. At 6.30 p.m., Dennis and his colleagues decide to issue a severe weather warning advising the public to seek shelter immediately. At their campsite near the lake, Kelly Garrett prepares supper for her family and friends. I started a fire and got that ready and the kids had set the table and put the watermelon out. I remember saying, go up and play at the park for a while. You know, supper's gonna be a little bit. And they said, no, we're gonna stay and stay by the fire. At her hillside campsite, Phyllis Galberg packs her car for the drive back home. Then I made a bite to eat for myself because I thought I'm not going to go and eat when I get home. I want to eat now. And I thought 7 o'clock I'll take off. At their family cabin, Lisa and Bill Gurley sit down to supper with the Holton family from Brampton, Ontario. As well as being a close friend, United Church Minister Jamie Holton officiated at Bill and Lisa's wedding. Nine days earlier, his son Lucas celebrated his second birthday in Edmonton. Now, as winds pick up and rain begins to fall, they remain inside to wait out what they expect will be just another Pine Lake storm. But the rain quickly turns into hail the size of golf balls. We were standing there watching it come down and we were running out and grabbing big pieces of it. Look at this, you know. And we were having fun, you know. I'm thinking, okay, this will pass. All of a sudden, the wind got up, and the hail started coming like bigger. And I'm trying to get kids into the trailer, but I just said, everybody stand in the middle of the trailer, or let's just calm down, and we'll, you know, this will pass. And I happened to look out of the front window, and it was like a wall of white coming towards me. Friday, July 14th, 2000. What began as thunderclouds 100 kilometers away 
has transformed into something much more dangerous, something no one at the Green Acres campground can see until it is too late. It's sitting in a, in a bit of a hill, a bowl, if you will, and it can't see the western horizon very well at all. And it turned out this storm approached right from the west. It would have developed within minutes from something that is just a severe thunderstorm to an F3 tornado. And it hit Pine Lake right around 7 p.m. When the tornado first touches down five kilometers away, it is 800 meters wide. By the time it reaches the campground, it has doubled in size with winds of 300 kilometers an hour. The howling monster crests the hill and heads down toward the beach, hurling cars and trailers into the air, uprooting trees and snapping power lines like sticks. Willie Proven grabs hold of his wife Margaret just as their trailer flips on its side, the roof ripping away. The couple disappears into the swirling vortex. Phyllis Galberg is just about to leave for home when the tornado hits her campsite. That tornado must have sucked me out because that door was the only door open on that car. The rest were all locked and everything in it, even to Chris's heavy tool case, you couldn't believe how heavy that was. And that was gone to it. Inside their family cabin, the Gurleys and their friends huddle together on the bedroom floor. Katrina Holtam clutches baby daughter Leah to her chest. Lisa Gurley cradles her own son, one-year-old Jared. A window shatters, and the cabin disintegrates. Wreckage batters them from all sides as the wind snatches Lucas from his father's arms. The tornado demolishes the wash house then closes in on the Garrett family trailer. And I remember looking out and all I could see was trees breaking. And I remember hitting the floor and yelling at Clark because it just sounded like a locomotive train coming through the whole campground. And I remember praying to God, all of us chanting and praying to God. And then all of a sudden we started hovering and I could feel us moving, like starting to just go. And next thing you know, it, there was this tremendous crash. Our neighbor's trailer had actually lifted off from his pad, and literally up it went. It shoved us over, landed on our trailer. I remember having my daughter in my arms and looking out the window, and the lake almost looked like it was moving sideways. And I remember looking out to the left uh, where my mom has a big greenhouse, and I thought, hang on a second, I don't see the greenhouse there anymore. <laughs> and right when I went to shut the window, it basically ripped off in my hands, and the, and the door flew out, out onto the deck. This was like really loud and really intense, and then gone. There was just dead calm after that. The tornado continues east for another 15 minutes before it lifts off and disappears. In the 30 minutes since touchdown, it has cut a swath of destruction 20 kilometers long. We went outside and every one of the uh, pine trees was, was chopped down about halfway and uh, it was just beautiful. The sun was shining, it was a perfect summer evening already. All of a sudden my cousin came running down the hill saying that it was a tornado and that Green Acres was in big trouble. The tornado has come and gone in a matter of minutes leaving behind a breaking sky and death-like silence. It looked like a war zone, because there was nothing left. Trailers weren't trailers. Trailers were part trailers. There was frames hanging here and pieces over there. And we looked over, and there was the watermelon still sitting on the, the picnic table. Went around the corner, the fire's still going in the fire pit. It's like. How did that happen? Proof of the tornado's incredible power is all around them. A trailer impaled by a picnic table, an aluminum boat wrapped around a tree, a golf ball embedded in a motorhome. Those who come to help find similar evidence as they cross the lake, moving past trailers and other debris floating in the water. There was several capsized boats, um, 
pieces of furniture, clothing, uh, propane tanks, picnic tables. And as soon as you turn the engine off of the boat, you really start to, to hear the people yelling and crying and screaming. Nothing was organized and it was people running around um, looking for people that they knew were there and people trying to account for family members and friends. Everybody was just in a, in a state of shock. Bill Gourley is one of them. He has found his son Jared 18 meters from where his cabin once stood. And he is now desperately searching for his wife Lisa despite two broken ankles. He finds her close by lying unconscious in the mud. All Bill can do is hold her and wait for help. Throughout the Pine Lake campground, those who are able sift through the wreckage for others who may be trapped underneath. I remember going to actually one camp and we were banging on the door to see if there was anybody there and kicking in the door only to realize the other side of the trailer wasn't even there. Katrina Holton catches sight of her son's yellow shirt and shock of red hair and finds Lucas in the debris. She can see that it is too late to try to revive him. Scott Proven arrives at the campground in time to pull four children from a burning trailer, but cannot save his own mother. 66-year-old Margaret Proven lies dead at the bottom of the hill covered by a tarp placed there by his grieving father, Willie. A campground employee who finds no signs of life also covers the bleeding body of Phyllis Galber. He thought I was dead and he covered me up and went down just a little ways and then he came back because he heard me cry. And that's what I told him, don't leave me. And, and he said, I won't leave you, Phil. Kelly Garrett is still searching for survivors when she first sees Phyllis on the ground. I didn't think she was alive. She was in shock, major shock. Um, big gash on her forehead with um, her, her skin had all peeled back. I mean, she couldn't see. And her arm was really distorted and twisted. I could see her bone and um, I just knew that she, she, needed, she needed attention, and she needed it now. Paramedics transport Phyllis up the hill, with Kelly by her side. I remember her grabbing a hold of me and saying, you will not leave me. You will not leave me. Of the 254 people at the campground, 132 are transported to hospitals in nearby communities. The most seriously injured are airlifted to intensive care units in the larger cities, including Phyllis Galberg. I'd have never made it. I quit breathing twice on the helicopter and he had to put me on life support. And I stayed on that till after I finally got through the worst. Unfortunately, there are those who cannot be saved. Three-year-old Lisa Gourley never regains consciousness. In the end, the Pine Lake tornado takes 12 lives. In the days following the tornado, civilian and military search and rescue teams scour the campsite, the lake, and surrounding woods. Although search teams find debris a kilometer away, no further casualties are uncovered. An investigation shows that while weather warnings were issued by Environment Canada, even the few who heard them would have had little time to escape. That storm developed so quickly that nobody could catch up to its development quick enough. And it's very difficult to get the word to people fast enough so they can protect their lives. Almost impossible. The Pine Lake tragedy reinforces the need for more advanced technology in tornado forecasting. Environment Canada has just installed a complete network of Doppler weather radars. And that is the one, of, one of the most significant tools that we use to detect tornadoes. But I think even more importantly, it has really turned attention to public awareness about severe storms and what they can do if they do see a tornado or hear a warning. 
A memorial at Green Acres commemorates one of the deadliest tornadoes in Canadian history. Damage is as high as $12 million, but for so many, the cost is much higher. Phyllis Galberg spends two years in hospital recovering from her injuries. A brace replaces the elbow she lost during the storm, and scars etch her face, chest, and legs. And I'm still recovering in a sense, right? You know, there's, there's times that I don't feel just right, whether it's the shock of the whole thing or what, I don't know. Kelly Garrett and her family have had to make adjustments too, although theirs are more emotional than physical. It took quite a while for me to go back to Pine Lake. I drove through once. It wasn't the same though. Pine Lake to me is a closed book. I don't think I could do it again. Mark Twain once said, everybody talks about the weather, but nobody can do anything about it. Perhaps that's what scares us most when tragedies like the Pine Lake tornado occur, that they are products of something we cannot change, no matter how hard we try. We control a lot of things, but we can't control the weather. And not to be able to control weather and knowing that we're vulnerable, it's, it's scary. It's very scary.